Thank you, Amanda and Jeremy. Appreciate that. Take your Bibles this morning, if you will, and turn with me, if you would, to the book of Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 29. Matthew chapter 7, verse 13 through 29. Now, once you've found that, I'll have you stand as we read from God's word together this morning. Matthew chapter number 13, I mean, rather, chapter number 7, verse 13 through 29. Verse 13 says, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way, that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. Beware of false prophets, which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not every one that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven." Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, we have not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. And every one that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house. And it fell, and great was the fall thereof. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, that people were astonished at his doctrine. For he taught them as one having authority and not as scribes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful today for your goodness, your blessings. We are thankful for the power, the authority of your word as it speaks to our hearts as only can do of any book ever, ever that has been published. And yet this is not just any book. It is the book. 
It is your word. You've given to us as mankind that we might get to know you better, that we can communicate with you. Father, we are grateful for the living word of God that we have within our hands today. And I pray that you will speak to our hearts this morning. I ask that you'll fill me with the power of the Holy Spirit of God and that we would have spirit-filled listening this morning. Father, I know that it's a busy week. Many have been busy already with much on their plate, so many responsibilities. And maybe that would occupy our thoughts if we'd allow it this morning. It would help us to push those things aside for just a little while as we focus our attention entirely upon you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Here in Matthew chapter number 7, we have an interesting uh, um, uh, story for us as the Lord Jesus Christ is relaying to us uh, some very important truth. And if there's one thing I, I would encourage you to, as we point out this morning, um, regarding the number two. I think uh, a number of years ago I preached on the book of Revelation and we went through a series uh, regarding numbers in the Bible as well and the importance of numbers and how they apply to many of the Bible truths that we read. The number two is a very important uh, number in the Bible. Uh, it has a lot of significance in the Bible and the way I see it, uh, there is much that we could learn as we research that number two. For example, the two tables of stone, the two sons of Aaron. Abraham had two sons. Isaac had two sons. Two in the tabernacle, you had the uh, two goats, two turtle doves, two pigeons, two oxen used together, and Samson who pulled down two pillars in the last uh, moments of his life, two witnesses, two resurrections, the tribulation, you have two periods, and then you have two by two as they came into the ark, the two sets of brothers and the twelve disciples, you have the widow's two mites that were put into the offering plate that resounded around the world even 2,000 years later as a wonderful uh, uh, responsibility and significance for us to see when it comes to giving. And then you have the two thieves in the cross, one chose to follow Jesus Christ, one chose to go his own way, one would be in heaven today, the other would not. And then you have two shall be grinding, the Bible says, or two in the field, uh, when the, re- or the return of our Lord Jesus Christ comes, and that trumpet sounds, and we will be taken up, we call that the rapture, up into the clouds to meet him in the air. Two births, two deaths, two foundations in our text. And there are two ways you can go at the end of this life. The way I see it depends which choice you make even today. And if you're listening online uh, this morning, just encourage you, consider the truth of this message, how it applies to us in the future, how we will live out our eternity. In Matthew chapter number 7, verse 13, we have a very important message. Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way. And leadeth to the destruction, many there be that go in their at. So we have two entrances we're talking about here. Uh, go over to uh, also, uh, if you would, to the book of uh, Joshua chapter 24. Joshua 24. Just before Judges, Joshua 24, and verse number 29. Joshua chapter number 24, I'm sorry, verse 15, I said 29. Verse 15 says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. You know, a choice must be decided. You know, if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, the challenge is choose who you will serve. It's so easy to get off track and start focusing on how much money we make, what kind of house we live in, what kind of uh, uh, things we have at our, uh, our driveway, uh, whether it be a boat or a house or a pickup truck or what kind of things would occupy our focus for the future. But God says, wait a minute, you need to include me in your life. There needs to be a choice, a conscious decision. Who are you going to serve? Uh, the God of this world, or are you going to serve me? Now, as a born-again Christian, you know that your uh, eternity is secure once you've asked Christ into your Savior. But God says, I want more than that. I want your life. 
I want your heart. I want your focus. I want your attention. I want your future. He says, give that to me, and you will find contentment and peace and joy, all the things the world is searching for and grasping for and can never get. You can never attain it by having goods or uh, enough money. Uh, I've known a number of millionaires in my life, and uh, they all have one single thread of common uh, thought, and that is they're always looking for the next project, the next job, the next uh, way of making extra money, the, you know, watching the stock market or watching where gold is at the moment. And yet the Bible says little things are not bad for us. It's not wrong to have things, but our focus ought to be on serving God. The way I see it, we have a choice. We'll serve the gods of this world or serve God. Now, if you're saved, you're secure. And if you're not saved, you want to make sure you're secure by trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And if you don't know him, drive a stake in. On this day in September, uh, that you know Christ is Savior, so when the old devil comes along and tries to dissuade you or cause you to get off track, you can say, hey, I remember the day I trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. It was this day at this place. I remember it, and the Holy Spirit of God uh, you know, uh, uh, was witness to that fact. And I've been sealed under the Holy Spirit of God until the day of redemption. And the old devil cannot hold up against that kind of uh, uh, response. You know, so we always see that Satan has a counterfeit to all of God's plans. And Jesus told the disciples that. He said this in verse 15. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening walls. That is Satan's counterfeit. That wide gate that we're talking about, that broad way, is Satan's attempt to lure millions into the fiery pits of hell. Now, for 24 years, I've been preaching to you and trying to help you to understand, uh, you know, caution you, if, if that would be the better word, of those that might come in, even amongst us, that want to produce a false doctrine. Be careful of that. Be careful to what you read on the internet. Be careful to what you listen to on the radio. And it might sound like it is a warm fuzzy, and it aligns with your Christian beliefs, but you be cautious. The old devil could get you off track so easily if you are not. And the only way you're going to stay on track is stay in this book. Stay reading it. Apply it to your life. Uh, uh, you know, spend time here. And I encourage every Christian, pick it up early in the morning. If you read this book early in the morning, you will find it will divert your attention to sin. It will divert your attention uh, to uh, maybe uh, doing things that don't amount to anything and keep you focused on the things that matter. It will help you when it comes to witnessing and telling others about Christ. You spend... Ten minutes in this book in the morning, and that will change the direction of your day. You will find God's word will come alive. And by the way, it's the best time because that's when your mind is the freshest. You know, uh, if you wait until nighttime, you're half a groggy and you're half asleep, and you're thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, the day is uh, taking its toll on me, and you start to read it, and next thing you know, it's morning, and the alarm is going off. You fell asleep. What happened? You get distracted. Take some of the good quality time of your life to spend in this book. God loves you, he cares for you, and he wants to have your attention. He wants you to uh, communicate with him, but he wants the good stuff. He doesn't want the leftover, the apple core of your life. He wants the good stuff, some of that good quality time when your mind is sharp and alive, and he can speak to you as you speak to him. So be cautious. There may be even some that will come into uh, North Country Baptist Church at some time and try to discourage you, dissuade you uh, by some false doctrine. A red flag should go up if that should happen. You be careful. If somebody starts preaching to you or speaking to you of something that is off the wall that you never heard of, that red flag ought to be a caution warning for you. You be careful. You go to your, your book, the, the Bible, and you study it out, and you find the truth for yourself. Satan has a very wide gate, makes the wide gate. It looks similar to the narrow one. I mean, that's his counterfeit. That's how he, he works. He paints the broad way with religious colors. There are some groups, and there are some uh, cults out there that will use Christian lingo, uh, the, the language that you would use in you know, relaying your relationship to Jesus Christ. They, they know the key words, but when it comes down to it, it's poison. Why? 99% of, uh, uh, of rat poison is good food. Only 1% is bad. But if you start taking and adding things to God's word that are not so, it's like rat poison. So be very cautious. You know, um, 
he's very successful. If, if the old devil, if you, he is bad, wicked and evil in every way, but if you would ever attain anything to being good, he's good at deceiving people. That's his job. He's been doing it for centuries and centuries. Don't think you're going to outwit him. The only defense you have is God's word and the Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit that resides in you. You know, he paints the broad way with religious colors and religious words and lingo. And he's successful in what he does. So my purpose is to warn you of what Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25 says. Look back there. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 25. By the way, as I mentioned this last week, I love it when you have your Bible with you and when I can hear the leaves turning. And if you like electronics, that's fine. You can use your, your tablet or your iPhone or whatever you got with you. Uh, like I have, I, you know, I have the Bible on, uh, you know, as an app on my phone. But I encourage you to take God's Word and read the Bible directly from God's Word and not on an app. Why? Because somebody's going to send you a message. Somebody's going to text you. Somebody's going to, you know, there'll be an interruption in your train of thought if you're not careful. And, you know, come on, if you're be honest. I mean, if, you're, if we're reading the Bible and you're reading your, uh, it with us on your phone and somebody, a good friend of yours, or maybe a son or a daughter texts you, you're going to read it. I mean, <laughs> you would, right? Um, if you have God's Word, the Bible in front of you, you won't have the interruption. So I encourage you to take that. So as we look at this, Proverbs 16, verse 25, it says, There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's the old devil's ways. He would try to deceive many into doing what you know, his plan is, and that is to keep you from coming to know Christ as Savior. Or if you're already saved, he'll try to keep you from fulfilling the plan that God has for you in reaching others for Christ. Now, there are, you know, I believe a time to remind us that because of mankind thinking, ever since there was a mankind, there's been two thoughts, two ways, uh, or two ideas when it comes to going to heaven. There is only one way. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. But there is two ways when you start to listen to the world. There's man's way and there's God's way. Man's way is what we would call work salvation. You see, religion uh, was founded on works. What must I do, you know, to be saved? You, you remember uh, Nicodemus in John chapter 3, where he came to Jesus by night? He, and, and, and he was probably one of the great scholars of his time uh, with the, the Jewish sect. But he didn't understand that who he was talking to was the Messiah. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 22, it says, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? What is that? Well, that's works. And in thy name have cast out devils? What is that? That's works. And in thy name done many wonderful? What? Works. That's what the word says. That's what the Bible says. Man's always sought his own salvation. Earn it. I mean, how many people you'll know that will put on the badge of I'm a self-made man or I'm a self-made woman. You know, I'm an entrepreneur. I've done it my way. I've done it my own way. That's not God's way. God said, your way won't work. He said, my way is the only way. You know, man has always sought his own salvation. Even Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, when they were, you know, they knew they had fallen into sin, so they went and they got some fig leaves to cover themselves, um, and, and they made those aprons, if you please. But God didn't accept that. That was their effort. That was their works to cover up their sin. And neither will he accept yours or mine. The only acceptance for covering of sin is the blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are always two ways uh, to salvation in the mind of people. There's man's way, which is works, and God's way, that is to be born again. That is a supernatural uh, 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 application of what Jesus did for us by receiving him as our Savior, and he cleanses us from all unrighteousness, the Bible says, and we become a new creature, a new creation on the inside. Sure, we look the same on the outside, 
but on the inside, we become a new creature. You are a three-part person. You have a body, you have a soul, and you have a spirit. Your body is not you. You think it is. You look at it in the mirror, you shave it in the morning, and you ladies comb your hair and whatever else you do. Um, uh, but nonetheless, uh, your body is only that which contains you. You are the soul. That's you. The soul will live forever, the Bible says. Now, when you were born, you were born with a sin nature. Now, understand this. You're a three-part person, a body, a soul, and a spirit. But your spirit is dead. So, as an unsaved person, you're only a two-part person. You're not a complete person. You're a two-part person. You have a body, and you have a soul. But your spirit is dead. The Apostle Paul mentioned that when he said you are quickened. That word quickened means to be made alive. Your spirit is made alive at the moment of salvation when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Invite him into your heart. Ask him to forgive your sins. You become a full, complete person. Body, soul, and a revived spirit, a living spirit. We always need to consider what the Bible says. You know, man says, I'll make it my own way. Uh, when you think that way, you are trying, or, uh, uh, or uh, it would appear, to be equal with God. Uh, that's why he tries to make his way to heaven. Uh, you know, when a man says, I can do it my own way. I'm a good person. I'm a good dad. I'm a good mom. You know, I, I, I give to the church. I, I go on mission trips. I, you know, I sing in the choir. I do this, this, and this. Those are all works. No, they're not bad things. They're good things. But that is not going to get you to heaven. Not one step closer. Man's attempt to make himself equal with God, well, that's why he tries to make it on his own way. But that's humanism. If man acknowledges that God is superior, then man must submit to God. And that word submission is a hard pill to swallow for many people because they simply don't want to submit to anything. In the authoritarian type of world in which we live today, and in, in, in a world that says, hey, uh, I, I, I am my own. Leave me and my family alone. And we, we even think of you know, our younger generation that doesn't want to submit to any authority, whether it's a police officer or military or our government or mom and dad or a teacher. You know, that whole aspect of submission seems to be a hard pill to swallow. But God says, you need to submit to me. Man says, I'll make it on my own way, but we need to submit to him. So maybe you sincerely try to keep the Ten Commandments. Well, that's good. Maybe you are a helping person. Maybe you give a lot, and maybe you do things in your community. You help do things around the church. You're always working, 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 doing things in the hope that those things will be enough to earn you a way to heaven. All of those things are man's way and all lead to, sorry to tell you, a place called hell, the lake of fire, where the soul lives forever, the Bible says. The worm dieth not. Friend, you have the, a choice. The way I see it, you can either choose Jesus Christ as your Savior or reject him and pay your own penalty in hell. Choose Christ as your Savior. He's already did the work for you. He's already paid the penalty by dying on the cross and shed his blood that you can be saved. If you reject that, then the other alternative is to pay your own penalty by going to a place called hell. That's not a warm fuzzy, and you'll not hear it in every church in Aurelia, but I'm telling you, that's what the Bible says. That's where we need to be at. In several places in the New Testament, we see the phrase, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Man's way is through his own works. I'll try to get there on my own. Please, 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 if I could beg you, do not do that. <laughs> but it doesn't say to earn eternal life, but to inherit in, in eternal life. When we trust Christ as Savior, we inherit eternal life from him and the sacrifice he made. Then we see there is God's way, of course. Look at John 3, John chapter 3, verse 1. We see the story of Nicodemus. There was a man of the Pharisees, the name of Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these things and miracles which thou doest, except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, now whenever you see this in the Bible, when it says verily, verily twice, that means listen up, this is important, don't, don't, don't miss this truth. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Very clearly, Jesus is telling Nicodemus, you cannot go to heaven without me. Nicodemus saith unto him, how can a man be born again when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Well, that's logical thinking. 
uh, after what Nicodemus has just heard. And Jesus answered, Verily, verily, there it is again, twice, verily, verily, I say unto thee, except the man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter in the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. And friend, if you are not born again, you are not going to heaven. I'm sorry to tell you, you must be born again, according to Jesus' own words here. That's why we say, born once, die twice. Or born twice, die once. If you do not submit to the new birth, you will bring about your own destruction and doom forever and ever and ever in a place called the lake of fire. If you have been born with a sin nature, you need to have that ratified by the shed blood of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice he made for you in the cross. Psalm 51, verse 5 says, Behold, I was shaped in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That means every person in here was born with a sin nature. Every one of us. And, and there's nothing we can do to change that on our own realm. We must trust in what a Savior did for us, a sinless, dying for the sinful, a sacrifice for one that was unworthy, for one that was worthy, and it was made for you when Jesus came to this world and died on the cross for you. You had to be born again with God's nature. 2 Corinthians 5.21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. In 1 Corinthians 15.22, for, uh, for as in Adam all die, so even in Christ shall all be made alive. You see, when Jesus died from the cross for your sins, before you were even born, the sacrifice was made that you could have a home in heaven because of what he did for you. Your sins could be covered by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. You took off your unrighteous garment, you put it on that man that hung on the cross who was the man God, the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and you took his righteousness and covered yourself with his righteousness which allowed you to go to heaven. You see, there'd be no unrighteousness in heaven. Listen to me. Satan will cause you to believe that happiness can only come in things and thrills and opportunity. He will tell you that if you don't have a credit card or you don't have a new car or a new truck or you have the latest DVD or television in your house, uh, the latest fashion and clothes, then you cannot be happy. Can I tell you something? You're not looking for happiness today. You're looking for joy. Happiness can be diminished when that new car gets a dent or when that TV doesn't work or the electronic fail on that new phone that you just bought. The, the joy cannot be taken away from you if it is a joy that springs up within you because of what took place and a new birth, a new creation happened inside you. So let's look at the Bible for God's way to happiness. And as we do this, I want you to remember Satan's counterfeit his way. God's way says, give me your life. Deny yourself and follow me. Follow Christ. Luke chapter 14, verse 33 says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you, that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. God's looking for people that will sell out and serve him and live for him. To be a witness for him. That's why we go to such extents, you know, to uh, have tracts printed up like this one. Like how to get to uh, heaven from nowhere or from anywhere or how to get to heaven from anywhere. They're out there for you to take and there's a multitude of tracts out there. We want you to take them and give them to people. Why? The plan of salvation is in there. All you need to do is take that silent witness, give it to somebody. At the coffee shop, when you go through Tim Hortons, at, at, at the checkout, wherever it might be, somebody that you care about, give them that track. So they too can know the truth of what the Bible says about being saved. So we see God's way. God says, give me your life. Um, you want to be happy? Follow the Lord. Now, where is happiness? I can tell you where you'll not find joy. You'll not find happiness. Uh, it's not in unbelief. There was a man many years ago by the name of Voltaire. He was an infidel uh, and of the most you know, pronounced type of infidel. He was very vocal about it. He tried you know, religion to his, its fullest. He, he examined it, went back and forth. And then at the end of it, he never trusted Christ, but what he said, I wish I'd never been born. When I start to evaluate life, the value of life, of being born to the time of being old, he said, I wish I'd just never been born. It's not in pleasure. There was a man by the name of Lord Byron. He lived a, a life of pleasure and had all that a person could want. It, 
and he had anything that anybody could want. I mean, he had it. Just snap his fingers, and it was his. He wrote, the worm, the canker, and grief are mine and mine alone. Those things didn't bring happiness to him. Now, you'll find there are some people that uh, uh, maybe work their whole lives seven days a week and elevate to a financial pinnacle and finally get to the point where they think that that's all they're going to need, and then they find it's empty. And all that they strive for by reaching for those things is an elusive dream. The things they're searching for are within your grasp, and they come from this book, by knowing Jesus Christ as your Savior. It's not in unbelief or pleasure, and it's not money, that's for sure. Uh, there's a man by the name of Jew Go, uh, Jay Gould, and he was an American millionaire, and he had plenty of money to go around. When he was dying, he said, I suppose I am most miserable of all men, because it didn't bring him happiness. It's not in a position or fame or uh, a place in politics. Uh, um, a man by the name of Lord Beacon enjoyed more than his share of both, and he wrote, youth is a mistake, manhood is a struggle, and old age is regret. It's not in military glory. Think back to Alexander the Great. You know, he conquered all the known world at his disposal, and after he'd done all that, he began to cry. He wept. <laughs> Why? Because he said, there are no more worlds to conquer. That was my life. That was my focus. My all there was. Where then is happiness found? The simple answer is in Jesus Christ. The simple answer is knowing Jesus as your Savior. Jesus said, I'll see you again. And your, your heart shall rejoice. And your joy no man taketh from you. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 10 says, And whatsoever mine eyes desired, I kept not from them. I withheld not my heart from any joy, for my heart rejoiced in all my labor. And this was my portion of all my labor. And verse 11 says, Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought, and of the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, there was vanity and vexation of spirit, and there was no profit under the sun. This is a man who had everything. Uh, Solomon had the most of the most of the most, as well as wisdom. But then when he came to the end of it, he said, it's not worth much. You see, man's way is sand, wood, hay, and stubble, as we read in our text earlier. This is talking about your Christian life. It's speaking about what you do after you get saved. Everyone will build one of two buildings in your lifetime. Now, I'm not talking about the physical building that we have that we're sitting in right now. But every one of us will build some type of a building. If you live for things and for thrills, uh, then you're building wood, hay, and stubble. And it will burn, and there will be nothing left. It, you will have nothing to show for your whole Christian life. And it's sad. I have talked to Christians. Um, I have witnessed, and I have uh, encouraged, and I've even consoled many Christians that come to the end of the life and said, you know what, preacher? I look back. I've never won one person to Jesus Christ. Not one. What a sad scenario. What a distortion of God's truth and grace. That we are to be a witness to those around us. I mean, you never gave out one track? No, no, I never did that. You never invited anybody to the church? No, I was always so busy. I mean, you, did you ever teach a Sunday school? No, I didn't ever do that. Never even do anything for the Lord? Well, no, I got saved, and I, I, I gave, you know, money now and then. I mean, whenever, you know, I felt like I should. How sad to come to that point in your life. You know, if you live for things and for thrills, it's hollow. It's empty. You'll have nothing to show for your Christian life. There'll be no crowns in place at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ during the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. You will stand before him as a Christian, naked, your hands and your hands uh, hanging and ashamed because you did nothing for him. Don't build with wood, hay, and stubble, but do it God's way. Building upon a rock, uh, uh, gold, silver, and precious stones. What does that mean? Go out and, you know, uh, to Muskoka, find a rock and start a building? No. It means you build your life upon the rock. What is a rock? Jesus is a rock. He's a rock of our salvation. He, he is a rock of our existence. This is talking about our service, our sacrifice, our soul winning, our submission to him. It's talking about making your life a holy life, uh, a life patterned after the word of God and the holiness of God, a life surrendered to God, giving to him everything. Now, I'm talking to Christians predominantly right now. Don't quit. Keep on. Today is the first day of opportunity for you 
to go out and be a witness today. Don't put it off. Uh, today is the first day. Say, Lord, bring somebody across my path that I could be a witness to. And if I'm talking to somebody that's not a Christian, I would suggest to you this morning, trust Christ. Trust Jesus as your Savior. Satan desires to destroy you before you could ever get saved. He desires to steal away the word of God from your hearing, from your thoughts. If he can just distract you in any way to keep you from getting saved, then he will have accomplished his goal. But can I suggest to you that greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And that's the Holy Spirit of God. If you trust Christ as Savior, you'll find success. Vance Havner said, Christianity is not a happiness cult. It is not a success cult. A heart, it is the process by which God makes saints out of sinners. We're uh, His. We belong to Him. We, be, you know, we are, uh, in God's sight, precious. Even when we look at ourselves in the mirror and say, well, I don't amount to much. God can't do anything with me. I'm, no, I'm a nobody. I mean, uh, so am I a nobody. And so are you a nobody. We're all just nobodies. But the somebody, the important one, is Jesus Christ. And when we receive him to our, our hearts, you know, some of the most beautiful people I've met on this planet, and I've traveled in many countries in the world, some of the most beautiful people I've ever met are not beautiful on the outside countenance, but beautiful on the inside. And that will come forth in a thousand different ways in, in their, uh, uh, their appearance, in their face. It just radiates beauty. And it's what's on the inside. And that inside beauty comes from knowing Christ as Savior. We see God's way is rock, gold, silver, and precious stones are sacrificed to him. The way I see it, by the way, there's two ways to die. The rich man that the Bible speaks about died and went to hell without Christ. It is a matter of fact that you too will die one day, just as I will die one day. They'll have a casket or a, uh, you know, they'll have a, uh, uh, a box to put you in and you'll be buried somewhere at some point. Um, people will gather around for a service and uh, the preacher will uh, maybe have a service for you and they'll sing some songs. Then everybody will go back to the church and have uh, potato salad. But the fact of the matter is, all of us, the Bible says, are appointed unto di- once to die. And after this, the judgment. Where will you be after you die? Will you be able to stand before the Lord Jesus Christ? And by the way, it's not some spooky phenomena that you're going to hover around, uh, you know, uh, as some cults would, would say that, well, you don't go to heaven right away. You just kind of hover around the earth and, as a spirit. No. <laughs> to be absent from, from the body is to be present with the Lord. It's like closing your eyes here in this place and opening them up in heaven. And where you will be for your whole eternity will matter, the way I see it, by your decision of one of two things. Either trust Jesus Christ as Savior or try to own it on your own way and find destruction at the end of it all. Two choices to consider the way I see it. Choose a broad way and go to hell. The broad way is religion, tradition. And by the way, the word religion is used seven times in the Bible. Only one time of seven times is it used in a nice or a good way. That's James 20, 27. Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father exist to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. The other six times is not in a good light. See, you can either choose God's way or, or, or man's way, but man's way will end up in peril. You know, sometimes it's ceremonies, personalities, hope, lifestyle. All these are a part of the broad way the old devil makes an attraction to. But all of them lead to one place you do not want to go, and it's a place called hell. If any of these uh, are your method of getting to heaven, you will miss heaven and land right smack dab in the middle of a place called hell. Make sure of your future. Eternity is much too long. I'll be 70 in, a, in just a few months. You know, that has been like a vapor to me. And time goes by so fast. Man says, God will not send a man to hell. And that's a true statement. God never sends a man to hell. God doesn't, but you choose to go there because you have a choice. Trust Christ and go to heaven. Reject Christ and go to hell. God won't send you there. You choose yourself where you're going to go. He's done everything possible to keep you out of hell. Even listening to a message like this this morning, it is a red flag to go up. If you're not saved, you get saved. Jesus' own words about that narrow way in John 8, 24, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins, for if ye believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, the Bible speaks of dying, yes, physically, but then dying spiritually. 
And being cast into the lake of fire where the worm dieth not. That worm speaking of the soul. John 3, 18 says, He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Every unsaved person who would be listening today, if you're not saved, everything has already been done for you. All the things that are necessary for you to go to heaven. But if you choose not to receive Christ as Savior, everything is prepared for you to go to hell. You don't need to do anything else. Just do nothing. Only those who have done the right thing will go to heaven. What is that right thing? Not living right, not, not being right or having an a, a intellectual focal understanding of the Bible even. It's a heart knowledge of Jesus Christ and receiving him into your heart and asking forgiveness. The Bible says if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. What is the right thing? Place your faith in the shed blood of Jesus Christ there upon the cross at Calvary. Accept that as full payment for your sin. There's nothing else to be done. You don't have to work for it afterwards. That is the one element that is necessary for you to go to heaven. Repent toward God. That means that you are turning everything over and submitting your life to Him and putting Him in charge so that you are no longer holding the reins, holding the steering wheel. You're giving it all to God. Romans 10, 13, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, that whosoever is you. There are some today who would stand at that crossroads and maybe they're at a point in their life where they've got to make a decision. They'll either continue the route that they're going. They know that that route that they're going does not produce all that God requires, but they'll try anyway, or they'll choose the other way, the way I see it, and that they will choose Jesus Christ as their Savior, receive him into their heart, and have a clear path to heaven because of what Jesus did for them. There is a clear distinction We cannot earn heaven on our own. We must trust in the God that prepared a place for us. One narrow way points one way, the broad way to another way. It's doomsday or and destruction or joy and peace and happiness for all eternity. The narrow way, the way that leads to heaven. So you have to choose one. The way I see it, which road? Well, Joshua 24, 15. You know, choose you this day whom ye will serve. The gods of this world, or choose the God of heaven that loves you and cares for you. And by the way, he does love you. You say, nobody loves me. Well, that might be true, but God loves you. He loves you so much you can't even imagine how much he loves you. He made you. He created you. And he wants to spend time with you. And not just time while you're here on this earth. He wants to spend all eternity with you. He loves you that much. You know, there are huge warning signs standing before that wide gate that people will go in and plunge into by the millions. And they're crying out to you today, take the narrow way, take the narrow way, enter the straight gate. Go the other direction is a choice, but it leads to hell. Where will you be at the end of this world? John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. That's you. He's talking about people, the world, not the earth that we stand on today. He's talking about the people, the world. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son. That's his sacrifice. That's a payment for your sins if you would receive him. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, that's you again, that's whosoever. Anybody in this room or anybody listening online, if you are not saved, that whosoever applies to you. Any person You say, you can't be talking to me. You have no idea what I've done in my life. Friend, I've witnessed to people and I've seen people get saved that have done horrific things in their lives. Much, much worse than I think any of you had done or you'd be in jail (laughs) or dead already. I often refer to Comrade Dutch in Cambodia who sacrificed the lives of a quarter of the population under the leadership of Pol Pot. In fact, under his own interrogation, (laughs) <laughs> of the 20,000 people he interrogated in Phnom Penh, seven lived. They were brutally starved and murdered. Chained on a big area the size of this room. I saw pictures of it lined up like cordwood. Bodies, men, women, and children, stark naked, given one teaspoon of rice a day and two teaspoons of water. Starve them to the point where they would confess to crimes they never committed. And when they confessed, they would take them out 
and they would put them in the killing fields and they'd be executed one after another. 20,000. The man with the monster, the cruelty, I won't tell you all the things that he did, but the cruelty was beyond comprehension. Vietnam invaded Cambodia. When they came into Cambodia, they overthrew Phnom Penh, the major city. Comrade Dutch fled. He went to Thailand to get away. Trying to get away from the persecution of war crimes. You know what he did when he went to Thailand? First thing he did, he went to work for World Vision. Nobody knew who he was. He was hiding. He was trying to stay secret. He thought that would be a safe haven. After a year of working for World Vision, he went to work for another American association and a humanitarian set and met a Baptist preacher who shared with him the truth of God's word, and that man got saved. He was a monster, but he got saved. He went to China after that, and after a while went back to Cambodia and lived in the far regions north of where our children's home is in Cambodia. We're in central north Cambodia. That's where we work. And, and, and he was further north than that until 2003, a man named Nick Patton showed him uh, that he knew who he was. Nick Patton said, you know, if I go there, he'll probably have me killed. He had a lot of power, a lot of people behind him. But he said, I'm going to go anyway and expose Conrad Dutch. Conrad Dutch said to Nick Patton, I've trusted Christ as Savior. And three days later, he walked into Phnom Penh, gave himself up to the police. He's in jail today. He'll be there for the rest of his life because of his crimes. But it doesn't change what happened inside. God changed that murderer, the wickedness, the horrific, the offender, the man that was such a monster that killed families husband, wife, and children in front of each other slain by that monster. But God loved him still. Don't tell me that you've done bad things. God wouldn't accept you. He would. And he will if you'll only trust him. The way I see it, you have a choice this morning. You can either trust Jesus Christ as your Savior or you can say, I don't believe all that Pastor Crow says. I don't think I could uh, uh, you know, submit to a God I cannot see. I don't think I want to go his direction. Friend, if I could just encourage you, when God deals with your heart, and you know he is, and there's a still small voice speaking to you, please submit. I love you. I care for you. That's the Holy Spirit of God speaking to you, and he wants you to be saved. If you're here today and you're not saved, friend, get it settled. Eternity is much too long to put it off. And yet, God has given the opportunity for you. If you just come to him, ask him to forgive your sins. The Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Won't you trust him today? And if you're here and you're born again, won't you just say, preacher, <laughs> I've been living to self. I've been saved for years, but I never did anything for anybody else. I never, I never witnessed anybody else. I, I've never been living for God. I've been living for self. And, 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 and I've just been so focused on my own self, I haven't thought of anybody else. Friend, if that's you, wouldn't you just come to Jesus and say, God, use me. For I believe God will use anybody that's willing to be used. And he'll use you. And if you're here and unsaved, he wants you. For God so loved the world, that's you, that he gave his only begotten son, that was his sacrifice for you, that whosoever believeth in him, that's you, should not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's promise for you. Won't you trust him? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we could spend together this morning. Grateful for each one that is here. I pray, Father, if there's even one that does not know you as Savior, it would be all worthwhile if they would come forward and say, yes, I need Jesus Christ in my life. I need the forgiveness of my sins that only he can give so that I might have a home in heaven. Father, if there's even one like this here this morning or listening online, I pray that they would get that settled. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.